In the last video, we designed a complete API specification using OpenAPI spec. Now it's time to scaffold it. In this video, I'll show you how to take that spec from AnyPoint Exchange, generate a fuel mule project in AnyPoint Code Builder, and get it running locally. But we're not stopping there. I'll walk you through what actually gets scaffolded, how to explore your flows in both XML and UI views, how to fix common project setup issues, and how to start working like a real dev in VS Code with Git, Postman, error handling, and all the ACV essentials. By the end, your API will be running and you'll actually understand what's going on. So we finished our API spec, we published to Exchange, and remember that there was a message at the top saying if you wanted to scaffold or not, and we selected no. So now we have to kind of get that going. So for that, we're gonna go ahead and go here in MuleSoft. Because we already have this in Exchange, it doesn't really matter if you have it in your computer or not. We're gonna go ahead and click on Implement an API, select a project name, like to do API impl, we're going to select a project location and we are already signed in here to our AnyPoint platform. If you haven't done this, please go ahead and take a look at the previous videos to do that. And now we can search for Todo API, for example, press on enter. And I have here my Todo task API, select add asset. I will leave my meal runtime and Java version as default and click on create project. Once the scaffolding has finished, you will see all of your flows here. Note that we'll have some error handling here happening. This is because this is the default for a lot of errors that can happen if we take a look at them. We can see here, for example, we have a bad request, we have a resource not found, which is a 404, a method not allowed, and so on. You have here the target. This is the target payload. And if you go ahead here, you can see also the variables HTTP status, which is 405. So that way you can see not acceptable, which is a 406, um, for example, unsupported media type, which is a 415, and so on. All of these error messages are created by default. You don't have to even define them in your API specification. Now, what we have here is a listener. If we take a look at it, we have a connection configuration in a path, which will start with API. You can also press here to see the configuration. And we can take a look. This is running on the host, local host, and the port 8081. We're going to keep this for now. Let's do the best practices in a later issue. Then here on the top, we have the flow list. So we have one flow per method. Remember that we had the two gets, the delete, the post, and the put. So we have one flow per each one of these. We also have an API console that you honestly can just leave it out. A lot of people don't use it, or you can just leave it just in case. For now, let's just leave everything as is. And we can see that we don't have a lot of other configurations. We have the log for J resources. And we also have here on test in resources, we have a bunch of embedded in a log for J. Git ignore is also automatically created for us, which is pretty handy when you want to start using Git at any moment. We also have the mule artifact.json that you don't have to change directly there. And we also have the POM in case you want to take a look at it. For the general overview, I would say here, whatever you have here under search main mule, you can right click on it. And I invite you to check out the open mule project properties because that's really important. Once it opens, you will be able to see what you have in your mule artifact.json, but you have this neat UI that you can select. And also it will download any of the runtimes if you don't have them already in your computer. So as it says here, for example, I only have 496 in my computer, but if I select any other one and I click apply, this will download the runtime or even the Java version if needed. In this case, I can select 11, for example. Another cool part of that is that you can come here to the connector side and take a look at all the connectors that you have in your palm.xml. For example, the API kit module, the HTTP connector, or the sockets connector. All of these were, of course, automatically added to the dependencies because of the scaffolding. But here in the dropdown, you can take a look to see what versions are available. And you can also see if you're on the latest version or not. The other cool thing is that you can see what versions are incompatible for either the runtime or the Java version that you have selected here. 
Now to get rid of these embedded folders that they're ju really just creating some sample data. So you have some sort of sample data in case you want to see all of your connectors, but we don't really need them. So go ahead and click on the Git ignore right here and scroll down and you can just keep adding stuff here. For example, search test resources embedded and then everything that is called embedded, you can just remove it, save, and this will automatically just not show them here. If you want to get started right away with a repo, you can go ahead and select here source control and click on initialize repo if you don't have one already. This will automatically give you here all of the files and folders. And because we already added the embedded folders here, we don't see them on this side. Another folder that you may not want to send to your repo is a VS Code folder. So you can either right click here and click on add to git ignore. This will automatically add it here, but it will add one file at a time. So you can also just do this and it will remove the whole folder. So for example, we have here some changes which were of course added because this is a brand new repo, but all of these we know that we want. So we can just add them here. We don't have to commit them right away, but we can have them here so we can see all of the new changes happening. Let's also minimize this so we can take a better look at everything we have here in the canvas and see some of the buttons that we have here at the top. First is the open agent force button. We're not going to go through it. We can see it in a later video. Just know that it's there. The open changes button is more related to the source code uh, or everything that we saw on Git. Then we have the opening code editor. This is important if you want to take a look at the XML and you can also just close the canvas if you just want to see the XML version and not the UI version. The final button is to deploy the mule project to Cloud Hub, but we're not going to do that yet. Also, if you have the XML open instead of the UI, you will see this other button, which will open the canvas UI. So you can either have them both at the same time or just close one and keep the other one open, whatever works best for you. Another cool thing that I learned is that right now the default, whenever you open a mule configuration file, like an XML file, it will open in the UI and not the XML. So if you want to change that, you can just click here on these buttons, click on configure editors, and then you will see this right here, search main mule XML. So you can edit that and change here, put default instead, click on OK. And now next time that you open this, it will open in the XML view instead of the UI view. So if you want to do the other way around and go back to the canvas, just again, look for source main mule and change instead of saying default, make sure that it says the mulesoft.projectfile.canvas and now it will open in the canvas directly. This tip was brought to you by Ryan Carter. Thank you so much, Ryan, really appreciate it. Some other options that you can find if you right click here is the opening canvas and code editor will, which will open both views at the same time. We already saw the open mill project properties. There's the deploy mill project to cloud hub, same as the button that we have here at the top. We also have the publish mill project to exchange export to mule deployable jar or export shareable jar. These are different because if you export to mule deployable jar, you can use this jar to deploy it to cloud hub, but you cannot open this from studio, for example. But if you were to export in a shareable jar, then you can open this jar in your IDE to actually see the code. Also, without making any changes, we can go ahead and press on this button here and we can start debugging or running this application just to make sure that everything is set up correctly. Once we can see that this has been deployed, then we can start testing it. You can use the Postman extension or any other REST client extension that you may have in VS Code. I'm going to use this one that's called Postcode because it's very simple to use. And because I don't necessarily need to keep these requests safe somewhere, otherwise I would use Postman. So if we remember, we had the localhost 8081 slash API slash tasks, we can send or press on enter and we will see a 200. Okay, we don't have anything here in the body because we haven't actually implemented anything. We can also do tasks one to test it out. And again, we have a 200. Okay, but nothing in the body. 
we can also go and take a look at the command line here in the terminal and we can see that there were some logs happening here we have here the get and we have here another get and another get because this is actually running so okay we have everything set up we can stop this application now all right we've scaffolded our api explored everything that any point code builder gives us out of the box and you've now got a much better feel for how to work inside vs code with mulesoft we didn't touch any flows yet but now you know how to find them how to view and edit them in both ui and xml how to set up your default views run the app locally and even get started with source control and helpful extensions like postcode and postman in the next video, we'll start implementing real logic to our tasks API, starting with the get and the post methods, and we will continue with the rest of the methods. If this helped you feel more confident working in ACB, give it a thumbs up and drop a comment below. I read every single one of them. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the implementation video coming up next. All right, that is all for this video. I hope to see you in the next video. Bye.